Welcome to the Interlocked Bible Study. We're on Lesson 33, the second part of the lesson, and we're talking about the birth of Christ. So the Messiah has arrived. He's now on earth, and this is where we're at in our narrative, the biblical narrative, starting from Genesis, going to Revelation. And we've learned a lot in, 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 in this study throughout the whole process. And one of the big highlights is the coming of the Messiah. In fact, everything centers around the Messiah, his coming, the plan of redemption that God has in, uh, laid out in place, and how that redemption, the buying back, the, the, the repurchasing uh, and, and the re redeeming mankind from Adam's mistakes and Eve's mistakes, uh, is done and accomplished through the person of Jesus Christ, uh, known as the Messiah, the Christ. And for, in order for him to accomplish his purposes, he had to be born, be born as a man, as a human, and, and be a perfect human and sinless. So in our last lesson, we talked a little bit about how sin is passed on from generation to generation, from person to person. Uh, and it comes from both the man and the woman and how uh, that is called imputed sin. And so we're gonna be covering uh, after imputed sin, the sin nature and personal sin. So in order for the Messiah to be the Messiah and to have the ability to uh, purchase us and redeem us uh, back to himself and, and for the sin debt to be taken care of, to be paid off, uh, the sin debt being death for the wages of sin is death. And then later it says, and if you go on, and the gift of God is, is given through Jesus Christ, the, um, through his grace. So uh, so for in order for Jesus to be the, um, the payer, the, to be the payment of, of our sin debt, he had to become a man, but a, a sinless man, a sinless human. He had to become uh, the perfect Adam not a an adam who failed and who who was listened to another another being's voice in this case lucifer but one who uh, obeys god 100% of the time uh one who is proven innocent and adam and eve and unfortunately failed the test of of being obedient to god thus thus representing all of mankind um, and and because there are a representative, sin has been imputed to us. We we've been we've inherited sin, and so therefore we cannot save ourselves. If we were to go down that path of saving ourselves, we would have to pay for our sin, and that's not a pretty picture. If you and I paid for the price of our sin, we would not only die physically, but we would be spiritually dead. We would be separated from God from all, of, all for all of eternity. And not just separated in any any uh, uh, obscure location where where there's this restless spirit that that roams the earth or, or uh, somehow reincarnates. No, it it is in a in a in a contained environment known as the lake of fire, uh, a place of unquenchable um, unquenchable pain and torment. Unfortunately, this is how uh, a place that God had designed and, and prepared not for human mankind, but for Satan and his angels. Anyone who follows after Satan falls under the same curse. So man, God didn't in his love create uh, hell for uh, man. No, he created it for Satan and all who followed him. And unfortunately, uh, Adam and Eve decided to follow and listen to Satan and thus brought all of us as consequentially, and this is where imputed sin comes in, uh, under the same consequences of their decision. And it was passed on to us. So we talked about that last last time we were together in our final our, our earlier recording. Now we're going to look at uh, two other aspects of sin. One is the sin nature, and the other is personal sin. So what is the sin nature? Well, as as Adam's descendants, we also inherited his corrupted sin nature. Uh, something in Adam's body was spoiled, and the spoiled nature has been handed down from father to child 
father to child, generation after generation. The the sin nature is not a genetic issue. Like it's not like you pass it on in your genes and there's some some specific ethnic groups that pass on more sin than others. Uh, Not at all. This is a a spiritual issue, uh, all of which traces back to Adam and Eve, uh, our forefathers. Uh, not for fathers, but uh, uh, our ancestors. Um, so although, however, in the same concept of genes being passed on from generation to generation, in that same concept, you have the sin nature, which is passed down uh, from child to child uh, and generation to generation um, uh, up until our time. And that had to be cut somehow, that had to be uh, interrupted and severed in order for there to be a a savior, someone who could rescue mankind from this this problem that we inherited, this issue which we, uh, we did not choose to be a part of but we inherited it uh, from our ancestors and 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 we needed a solution for uh, that sin nature so the sin nature is something that that you could describe as as being bent bent to do evil it's something where you and i <clears throat> uh, we have this inclination so as, as if you have a tree that grows <clears throat> Um, and, and you might notice that a tree will incline a certain direction. It'll start taking a certain bend and, uh, um, and it can be trained, right? Uh, a tree can be trained, but it has this bent, this natural desire. I have uh, some plants in my house and the, these particular vines, they grow direct. They, they they direct toward the sun. They love sunlight, and so they're naturally bent in that direction. Um, and and so it's it we as as human beings, as descendants of Adam and Eve, our nature is a sin nature, and so we're naturally inclined to sin. We're naturally inclined to be rebellious. What does that mean? That means that we're in charge of our own lives. We decide our own fate. Does that sound familiar? You decide your own fate. You are your your own man. You're your own woman. Uh, you get to decide. Don't submit to anybody else or any any other thing. Don't be you. You be your own thing. And uh, you see that in the time of Noah, and then later on we see it in in uh, the time of the, the the Jews in the Judges, where it says, "Every man did that which was right in their own eyes." And so uh, any time I'm in charge of my own life, my 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 leniency, the way, the direction I'm going to lean is toward evil. And that's because of what a thing we call sin nature in us, right? And you can try to 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 polish that and make it look good, but it doesn't change internally. We know we know we're inclined to evil, no matter how much you discipline yourself. And there are many who try, and different religions will try to discipline through strong and and severe discipline, uh, bring their bodies under subjection. But internally, there's still a struggle. There's still a struggle. You still struggle with your thought life. Uh, th- these desires that pop up uh, uh, all of a sudden you don't even know where they come from all of a sudden in your mind uh, an evil thought comes up and 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 and, and so our we're, we're we're conditioned in this direction we're bent in this direction and the the question is why well the reason is is because we have a sin nature which came down from Adam and Eve in Psalms uh, 51 5 it says for I was born a sinner Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. So in the sin nature that makes us want to sin and rebel against God. In a way, this, this sin nature is like a magnet attracting us towards sin. And the Bible calls this uh, living in the flesh or the sin nature. So let's read Galatians 5.17 to get a little more insight. The sinful nature wants wants to, wants to do evil. It wants to do its own thing, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants, the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. 
so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Okay, so so again, we can go into more detail on this at a later time, but uh, the idea here is that we have this strong impulse and inclination to do evil. The third thing uh, that's kind of stacked up against mankind, if you wonder why you struggle with sin, it's because you have the odds stacked up against you. But the third thing is personal sin. Um, and these are the sins that we are personally responsible for, that we commit. So you've, we've got this imputed sin. Yeah, we can just kind of brush that off and say, oh, yeah, that, yeah that's Adam. He represents us all so in, real, in real general terms. Or, or I have got this sin nature. I'm inclined to do evil, but uh, I, I don't actually do evil. I'm just inclined that direction. But no, the reality is, is that every human being commits at least one personal sin in their entire life. <laughs> there's there's personal sin that we're responsible for and that we have to give an account of to god um you see this even in little children uh, i raised three children myself and uh, and i was a child myself and and when you didn't get your way you reacted and and you intentionally uh uh told your mom off or, you know, um, rebelled against your dad and what he said. You intentionally did the opposite of what he or she asked you to do. Uh, and and I have children that, that uh, fell through the same, they went through the same stage of just, we're just going to do what we want to do. And, and they un- had to understand that there's consequences to personal sin. Every sin that you and I commit brings on a natural consequence okay uh, so the so not only do we have imputed sin from adam and we get we inherit the sinful nature from adam and eve and, and but we we have our own personal sin uh, I would add a third thing here that, uh, again, we don't use this as an excuse, but uh, uh, the, the, the things are stacked up against us in that Satan, just like he whispers in the ear of Adam and Eve back in, in, in the Garden of Eden and says, look, uh, you're, you're not going to die if you eat this fruit. God is basically lying to you. He's, he's, he's giving them false information. He's lying to Adam and Eve. You and I have uh, Satan still operational today, very, very operational, in fact, with his demons, his, the fallen angels that followed him, are very much operational in the world today and, and spewing lies all over the place. And you, you see it everywhere on, on media, uh, large media outlets, on social media. You see this interacting with other human beings, uh, how we've bought into lies. And it's and and everything's kind of inclined toward facilitating our sinful nature. Uh, everywhere you go, it's it's uh, not just let's have a drink, but let's 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 go overboard and drink too much. It's not just let's have a smoke, but let's ha- let's smoke weed that that uh, helps us forget about all of our problems. Or it's not about just uh, some sort of substance, but it's substance abuse. It, it, uh, everything that um, uh, that you see in the world today is bent toward facilitating our sin and our sin nature. So this is a a, a real uh, th- uh, issue that mankind has been facing ever since Adam and Eve made their fateful decision, and you and I in our life today are no exception. So these are the these are the three aspects of of humankind. So uh, um, if if all humans have these three types of sins, when Jesus was born as a human, how, how in the world was it that he avoided getting Adam's imputed sin? And how is it that he avoided uh, inheriting Adam's sinful nature and, and, and thus also avoiding personal sin? Well, the answer, again, like we mentioned in our last uh, session together, is through the virgin birth, through the virgin birth. That's, that is what solved the issue. That is how God could send his one and only son into the world and how this son in the world was sinless and could become the perfect sacrificial lamb for us to take on our sin and to satisfy uh, the holiness of God and his justice. Um, in order for that to be satisfied, there had to be a perfect human in order uh, that it was willing to give their life. And so Jesus became that, uh, the son of God became that. And the only way that this could have happened 
in God's uh, infinite wisdom is, is he refused to use the man, in this case, Joseph, uh, and, and, and yet he was able to uh, utilize the woman. So uh, um, through the virgin birth is how you see God accomplishing this, this miraculous task of, of, of becoming man, uh, completely sin, sinless, and being born in the likeness of man, and yet not giving up his godness, his, his being 100% God and perfect and holy and sinless. So let's look a little bit into the virgin birth and some of the details. Here's here's uh, here's the story of how it happened in Luke chapter one verses twenty six to thirty five. Let's read through it. In the next in the in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, that would be the mother of John the Baptist. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end, Mary asked the angel. But how, 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 how can this happen? I'm, I'm a virgin. Mary understood some of the basics of life and how it works. I'm a virgin. How is this going to happen? Verse 35, the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. So you see here the angel, and consequently uh, to we who are reading this, he doesn't give all the details. Mary didn't receive all the scientific details. If you want to try to figure this out scientifically, go for it. But there's a reason why uh, um, the angel did not make the scientific data the main thing. The main thing is that uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the Son of God, the third, you've got these the three people of the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three would be involved together, and, and Mary would be, it says, overshadowed. Uh, and the and 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 uh, in in her uh, body in her uterus you would have a a, a child um, emerge that has the spirit of the Most High God. This is absolute miracle, and so we do not have the scientific description of how this could have happened. And again, you can surmise, but you would be uh, filling in the blanks where the Bible does not uh, is not explicit. Uh, so, but however, we believe in the virgin birth and that the father of Jesus Christ is indeed the Holy Spirit, is the God, the Father, the Trinity is involved in this process uh, with Mary. And, and uh, in order for there to be a uh, God, 100% God, born 100% man. Let's read Romans 8, verse 3, the first part. What for what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
to be a sin offering. So Jesus was born with this physical body, just like your body and my body. But his his body was not controlled by a sinful person, an individual whose whose spirit was uh, uh, infused um, with sin, had a sin nature, or that was imputed sin from Adam. <clears throat> Jesus was perfect and holy, and therefore his body was not under the curse of sin. So with without Adam's imputed sin and sin nature, Jesus could live righteously. And he did not commit any personal sin as a result. This was how Jesus was free from all three types of sin. So the first reason why Messiah needed to have a virgin birth is because Jesus is God. And he will not mix. He will not mix with sin. The human body he took on had to be sinless. The second reason uh, that Jesus needed a virgin birth was because he came to be the savior of mankind. In order to die for man, he needed to have this sinless body, this body that was not controlled by a human that is under the curse of sin. He had to be the perfect lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice, a sinless human being in order to uh, demonstrate himself as strong, unlike Adam, who uh, after sinning uh, was was separated from God and, and taken out of the Garden of Eden where he could no longer partake of eating the tree of life, the fruit from the tree of life, and was thus separated from the, from the life-giving source. Jesus, however, is the life-giving source. He is God. He is the creator. He is the eternal one. And he was born in the likeness of man so that he could become a uh, human and, and, and the, the sinless human that, that God had intended for Adam and Eve to be in the, in the first place. But instead of using the man, he uses uh, um, uh, Eve as the instrument, excuse me, Mary as the instrument by which to bring about this virgin birth, the birth of his Savior. So for uh, if Jesus had sin in him, he would not have been able to be mankind's savior. He would have had his own sin to pay for. And you know where that leads. This, the wages of sin is death and not just physical death, but separation from God for eternity. So Jesus would have had to have paid for his own sin debt for all of eternity, thus annulling his ability to be our sacrificial lamb, the, the person who had the ability to take away the sin of the world. Um, but he was the sufficient sacrifice. He was sinless. Um, and he's Jesus willingly took on mankind's penalty the eternal death by dying a brutal death on the cross. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 3. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. Okay, let, let's stop there just for a second. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So some people say, hey, I, I, I keep the Ten Commandments. I've heard this. Many people have told me, I keep the Ten Commandments. I'm a good person. Well, the Bible here says you're not a good person because you don't keep the Ten Commandments. And then you argue again, no, but I do. I keep the Ten Commandments. And the reality is, is that you were born in sin and you are weak and therefore incapable of, of, of fulfilling all the Ten Commandments 100% of the time from the time you were born to the time you die, that you do not have that ability. You're weak because of your sinful nature. And Jesus explained to the, the Pharisees during his time through, through the Sermon on the Mount as well in Matthew chapter 5 that, uh, that this isn't just about the outward appearance and the outward obedience of the Ten Commandments, but the inward as well. It says if you, it's not about just committing adultery, the act of it, the physical act of committing adultery, but if you, th if you think about a woman in an improper way, uh, you have committed adultery with you, her already in your heart. So therefore, sin is a, is a spiritual issue. Whether your body uh, acts on it or not, whether you act on it or not, you have in your heart sinned. 
Okay, so let's continue. Uh, in Romans 8, 3, the, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sin. Okay, let me read that again. And, and in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us. You know, you want to walk in a perfect sinless life. The only way you're going to see that you and I are going to see that accomplished in, a, in our, in our lives in a practical way is is our identification with Jesus Christ is to walk in him walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh it's only going to be through him uh, he is the only strong one you and I are too weak we're too weak we're it's impossible for us in our flesh to to walk a sinless life no we're we're inclined in that direction so that's a topic for another time. But uh, here we're seeing here the point being that Jesus was God's solution. He had no imputed sin, no sin nature, and no personal sin. In Hebrews 10.5, it says, that is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. So it's Jesus in his perfect uh, body, his perfect sinless self uh, being that he is giving in sacrifice on our behalf. And you're going to see later on in, in, uh, you know, in, in New Testament studies how uh, righteousness is imputed to us, the, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And therefore, that righteousness is what uh, makes us perfect before God, acceptable to him through the person of Jesus Christ. Let's read 1 Peter 1.18. For you know that God paid a ransom. So God's the one paying his own ransom. God paid the ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. That would be Adam and Eve. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. Wow, this has been planned out long before Adam and Eve even sinned. But now in the last days, he has been revealed for your sake. What a blessing it is for you and I to live after the fact, after Christ has come, to be able to see these things unfold. What a huge privilege and honor. So, can a person move from unrighteous to righteous? Yes, it's through the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, who is sinless. And his, his righteousness is credited on our behalf to our account, just like in Adam, or excuse me, Abraham, when he believed God, it says it was credited to him as, Christ, as righteousness. So he was declared innocent before God. And in Christ Jesus, we're not just declared innocent, but we are accredited his righteousness to our account. So everything that Jesus represents uh, as he's seated in the heavenlies, in the holy of holies, at the right hand of God, as he is accepted in the Father, you and I are accepted in him, in the beloved. And we're not just declared innocent where our, our sin debt has been paid, but but he is also accredited to our account righteousness and, and the life of Christ. And so we, we, we're we not at zero. We have a bank account, a spiritual bank account that is loaded, absolutely loaded. We're not in debt anymore and we're not at zero. We are loaded full of spiritual blessings as you study in Ephesians chapter one, two, and three. 
All right. So if Jesus had not been born through a virgin birth, he could not have been the Savior. Rather, if Jesus had been born of a human father and mother, he would have been born a sinner at birth. He'd have been no better off than you and me, just like the rest of us. And when he, and then he himself would need a savior of his own. That is why the virgin birth is so important. It's key. It's essential. It's why uh, you see that it, as a doctrinal position uh, on so many in, in local churches. We hold to the virgin birth of Christ. Why? Because it is central to Christ being our, our redemption. Right, so let's let's ask a question here. Here's something that comes up often. Um, in it, did the Bible make mistakes in recording the genealogy of Jesus? So this is still in the line of of the virgin birth and the coming of the Messiah. Uh, and and you've got these two genealogies that seems like seem like a little bit like their uh, intention. And 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 some people even say no, this is a flaw in the Bible. This proves that the Bible is wrong. Uh, but but let's look at the examine the two different genealogies just a little bit. Uh, take a bit of time. One of them is in the book of Matthew. Matthew's account of the, the Messiah, whose focus was on Jesus's royalty. Matthew's chapter 1, verses 5 to 7, and then verse 16, you see this long genealogy of the, the lineage of, of Joseph, uh, the husband of Mary. Uh, we can't say Jesus's father uh, um, and be correct, uh, literally correct, um, but uh it, he would be the husband of Mary in this case. So you see his lineage. And then in Luke, you see uh, a focus on, on his humanity in Luke chapter 3, verses 23, and also 31 to 32. You, you've got another genealogy uh, where it's actually focused on Mary's, Mary's lineage. Uh, but the recording in Luke uh is is uh, you've got some of these wording that make it a little confusing especially where we see at the very last in in Luke where it says Joseph was the son of Heli and Jesus was known as the son of Joseph okay so it, it gives us the impression that you've got two lines of Joseph here and that they're in conflict of each other because how could J Joseph excuse me uh uh Jake yeah, yeah. How could Joseph be um, the uh, part of two lineages? Um, he he cannot have two different fathers. So let's look a little bit about this uh, about this tension here. So in Matthew's list, David's son is Solomon, and Solomon became king after his father died. But in Luke's list, David's son is recorded as Nathan, another son of Bathsheba. And you can find that in 1 Chronicles 3, 5. After that, both family lines are different until we get to Joseph, the husband of Mary. In Matthew's list, J list J Jacob is Joseph's father. But in Luke's list, Hilly is Joseph's father. How can this be? Exactly who is Joseph's father? So Bible scholars say that uh, the difference is because Luke was actually using Mary's family line, not Joseph's. Mary is also from the family line of David, but her family line goes back to Nathan, not to Solomon. So how, how do we know this? Okay, it's, it, it has to do with a lot of the wording in the text, in the Greek. So you've got this word, the, or um, ha, uh, it's H O, written as as a, a O, but it's pronounced Ha, uh, which means the. And so, in Mary's genealogy, the book of Luke was uh, with the. With, you can see the Greek text in front of you. Um, you, you see the the uh, Ho constantly. Uh, the Ha actually is pronounced after uh, 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 son, or right before son. So it's the son, the son, the son, the son, uh, but not in front of um, uh, being the son of Joseph. So that's an indication that this is in the line of, of the woman. And this was in Jewish tradition. 
people would trace uh, typically the family line of the man and not the woman. But specifically, Luke wanted to make sure everyone understood that Mary uh, is also a descendant, a direct descendant of David, and therefore uh, an heir to the throne. And so the Yahweh is, is fulfilling his promise in the person of Jesus. Uh, but what was the issue then with the line of, of Math, uh, Matthew mentions? The issue uh, was that there was a curse on that line and the dynasty was broken because of a curse so uh <clears throat> you, uh, you see that in both lineages the fulfillment of of, of the kingship of jesus christ uh in as a jew comes from both lineages but the line of joseph is a curse line and the line of mary is a direct descendant of of david through nathan um, and and so Jesus will be sitting on the Jewish throne uh, as the descendant of David, but through the lineage of Mary. Um, so you see that without that uh, that 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 uh, word the in front, it's referring to the female's line. In this case, Mary. So let's uh, let's continue on from this this uh um this concept after revealing this problem matthew immediately describes god's solution this problem of of coming from a curse line and he clearly states that jesus is not joseph's biological son he is joseph's son in name only so in matthew chapter 1 verse 16 and 18 it says jacob was the father of joseph the mother of mary mary gave birth to jesus who is called the messiah this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Matthew shows Yahweh's solution to the disqualification in Solomon's line uh, is through the virgin birth. The Messiah would be uh, free from the corrupt uh, lineage in David's line. And through Luke's gospel, we learn that Mary is a descendant from Nathan, uh, the other son of David, and was not disqualified. So you see, God's plan is not thwarted, even though a curse came on uh, on, on uh, Solomon's line, uh, God fulfills his purposes through Nathan. <clears throat> so Jesus is the son of God and the son of man. He is a hundred percent of both, and how how can this be? Uh, how how well, let's look at the names of these because you got uh, he's referred to as the Son of God in some places, and he's referred to the Son of Man in other places. One referring to his deity, and the other to his humanity. Let's look at the Son of Man real quickly. So in the Old Testament, we see the mention of the Son of God multiple times. And in this passage that we see here in Proverbs. The writer of Proverbs asks four questions about who it is that we can uh, that can uh, who it is that can do a particular thing. The answers are always it is the Creator God who can do the things mentioned. It's a it's a rhetorical question. Then the writer asks at the very end, "What's his name?" Proverbs thirty verses one to four. I am weary, O God. I am weary and worn out, O God. I am too stupid to be human, I, and I lack common sense. I have not mastered human wisdom, nor do I know the Holy One. For who but, who but God goes up to heaven and comes back down? Who holds the wind in, its, in his fists? The answer continually is, well, God does, the Messiah. Who, who wraps up the oceans? in his cloak who has created the whole wide world what is his name and his son's name tell me if you know wow so here you've got this revelation of yahweh and yahweh has a son and the question is asked what's his name so the creator god reveals his own name to moses as yahweh but this passage talks 
of his son, Yahweh's son. Immediately, the Jews would realize that Yahweh has a son. There's a son of God. Uh, but through the Old Testament, God did not reveal his son's name. But he provides another clue in, in Isaiah chapter 9. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment to the Lord of heaven's armies will make that happen. So there, there it was stated plainly that the Messiah would come as a son. He would be a descendant of David, and he would also be called mighty God. So while Jesus was on earth and he was talking with the Jewish leaders and they had refused to, to, to accept him and acknowledge that he was the Messiah. So Jesus challenges their thinking and asks them this question uh, that comes from Psalms 110. Let's read in Matthew 22. Then surrounded by the Pharisees, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? They replied, he is the son of David, which implies just a simple man. <clears throat> Verse 43, Jesus responded, then why does David, speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit, call the Messiah my Lord? For David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the, the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your, your enemies beneath your feet. Since David called the Messiah my Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? No one could answer him. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. So you see, David, uh, David is, is, is claiming that uh, he's, he's saying under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that, that uh, the Messiah is going to be the son of God. And, and he recognizes him as his Lord. And the, the Jewish leaders are struggling with the concept that the Messiah is actually 100% God and, and that comes in man's uh, form of man. And so Jesus is challenging their thinking uh, as, as, he, as he brings these, these truths to light. So what David was saying is that Yahweh is, uh, Yahweh is God. Or excuse me, the son of the, the Messiah is indeed God. David was calling the Messiah, um, calling David was calling the Messiah who was going to be the son of God, my God. And so Jesus was asking, how can the Messiah be both God and the son of, of, of David? Well, it, it's answered in that he uh is in uh, he himself is Yahweh, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the, the Son, and he is uh, a descendant of David. And so the, uh, this was news to the Pharisees. This, the Pharisees refused to believe, believe this truth and, and, and consequently rejected uh, Jesus the Messiah and had him killed cruelly on a cross. So this is where the title Son of God is. Uh, comes in. But then we see the title Son of Man. Although Jesus acknowledged that he is the Son of God, the mo the most he mostly used this title Son of Man. That was the most frequently used that Jesus said about himself. This this name shows that he is human and reminds people that he is the second Adam. So Adam, the word Adam in Hebrew is just this, just the word for man. So you know you like saying, hey, man, hey, Adam, it's the same thing. So Jesus is the second man, the second Adam, who will fulfill all of the obligations that God gave mankind that Adam failed in. Jesus uh, is successful in and will be successful in as he rules and reigns in his kingdom that is yet to come. So what is also, when the Jews heard the title Son of Man, they would be thinking of, they would be recollecting the prophecy recorded by Daniel. In this vision, Daniel saw four terrible beasts coming to rule the earth. Uh, 
These beasts represent the same kingdoms as the ones from Nebuchadnezzar's statue, the lion, the bear, the leopard, uh, this beast from the, the, the rise um, uh, from the Roman Empire. Uh, you've got the Antichrist, uh, who's also referred to as a beast. But then you have the Son of Man, who is uh, the one who is to who is going to crush all the, the other human kingdoms that rise up. So these terrible, terrible beasts uh, represent the evil kingdoms of man that tried to rule but failed. Um, it's interesting that the imagery is, is to beasts. Now, God gave dominion to Adam and Eve uh, to, to a man, not to beasts. He didn't give uh, the world uh, over for the animals to rule. He gave man to, uh, dominion over the beasts. So it's interesting that the use of uh, the imagery of beasts when he talks about Nebuchadnezzar um, and, and the other, other mighty kings of old. So God's solution then is to send the perfect righteous man, the Messiah, uh, in the form of Adam, but a second Adam, a successful human being, a human being that was obedient in all, all points, uh, who failed not in one single uh, aspect of the, uh, the, the Ten Commandments and all the commandments of God given in Deuteronomy and uh, the Old Testament. But no, he, he, he was the perfect human and the perfect leader. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, it says it like this. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. So this is the conquering Messiah, like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. So this is the Messiah's kingdom <clears throat> that is being described here in the Son of Man. So you have the Son of God and his deity and the Son of Man in his humanity, and it's in reference to his kingship over all the earth so this is was a huge paradigm shift for the people of jesus's time let's look real quickly in the time that remains with us for this session at the incarnation of christ it is the clearest revelation of god the incarnation of the christ is the clearest revelation of god john chapter 4 Verse 24 says, God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. When Jesus came as a human, people could see God and interact with him, touch him, and hear him teach. It took the revelation of God to a whole new level. God himself, Yahweh, God is with us. So he was the spiritual light shining in the hearts of men and women everywhere <clears throat> but what what is often man's response on one hand you have people who believe and trust god and understand yes he is the messiah and others that flee from god they free flee from the light uh you see, as soon as the the light reveals truth reveals uh the the lies and the sin uh, uh often man will run from that and try to hide so you have these two reactions. What is your reaction? Let me ask that. Is your reaction when, when, when God reveals sin in your life, do you run away? Do you flee from him and you try to hide away? Or do you allow the light to, to reflect who you really are, the, the darkness within, the, the sin within, and say, woe is me. Yes, I am a sinful man. I am a sinful woman. Uh, who can save me from this this body of flesh and then and then you say thanks to god through the lord jesus christ it's what it has written in romans john chapter 3 verse 18 says it this way there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in god's one and only son 
And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for the fear of their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right will come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. So this is God's explanation of unbelief. Imagine walking into a dark room full of people and then you turn on the lights. And then someone in the room says, I can't see any light. He denies it. Our response to them would not be, oh, the light must be broken. Let's just change everybody else's opinion to match your opinion. You see that happening around us today. Instead, our response would be, you're acting blind. Um, The light is everywhere, understanding. So move over from your unbelief to belief. Understand that the truth and revelation of God is, is obvious and staring at you right in the face. Romans 1.18 says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. So God is revealing, revealing, and revealing light information, and he's shedding information on it. And mankind is getting more and more callous to the truth and rejecting it. They're believing in other narratives, narratives that are based on man's thinking and man's ideology and not on God's word. So we often hear people rejecting Jesus. He's saying, no, he's not real. He's not a real historical man. Jesus is just a good teacher, but he's certainly not God. Jesus didn't really come back to life. That's just a myth. The Bible is full of errors. How can you even trust it? There's no evidence of God anywhere. It's all in our minds. It's faith. It's religion. There's no evidence. Science proves that the Bible is wrong, and so on and so on. You get all these all these arguments against uh, uh, embracing the truth and light that God has shed on, on mankind and the information. But we all have people like this in our lives. What should we do? First, first of all, thank God that he has helped you understand the truth and embrace by faith this Savior that he's given us in the person of Jesus Christ. Then pray that the all-powerful and all-loving God of the universe will also help our unbelieving family and friends to stop stop being proud and humble and stubborn and, and, and humble themselves to accept the truth. And and let God do the work in their lives. Sometimes that can be very difficult circumstances that comes into their lives. But we're to love our friends and our family that are unbelieving as best as God shows us how. And when the Holy Spirit prompts us, we share with them God's truth as revealed in Scripture in a way that is understandable and comprehensible, in practical ways as well. Sometimes we don't even say things, but it's through our actions And we keep praying that God will help them drop their hands uh, and open their eyes to see and believe in the Savior he's provided for them. So don't give up on your family and friends. Be faithful. Continue to pray. Walk with God. Be the light. Uh, Be the witness. And and don't argue them into, into salvation, but definitely be Jesus's hands and feet to them and share with them as opportunities arise. God bless you. And we'll continue on with the next lesson in the next session.